Hello, this is Stan Close. When Texas Governor Rick Perry suggested that some Texans might want to secede from the United States, his remarks drew nationwide news coverage and became fodder for many late-night comedians. Since then, fanned by angry citizen contempt for Washington, succession movements have sprouted up in more than a dozen states all across this nation. Today, with the federal debt soaring, offshore oil exploration in doubt, real estate foreclosures at an all-time high, and Europe slipping on Greece, a perfect storm may ensue propelling the secession movement into mainstream America. It is therefore prudent to revisit the southern states' secessionist movement when they overstepped their authority by seceding from the United States in the 1860s. True, fugitive slave laws not being enforced in the northern states was a primary cause of the secession, but the federal tariffs levied on the southern states by the north far outweighed that slavery issue in the minds of most 19th century southern secessionists. Today, these 19th century secession tariffs are merely a microcosm of what taxes are about to be leveled on the American public just to pay the interest on the U.S. debt and fund the baby boomer entitlements. We the people are teetering on financial ruin due to out-of-control government spending and borrowing. If this continues, secession might become the only avenue that fiscally sound-minded states may deem appropriate to protect their citizens in the event of an economic collapse. To protect we the people, the framers empowered the states with three constitutional provisions. First, the state legislative appointment of U.S. Senators. Second, a state's rights 10th Amendment. And third, the Article 5 constitutional amendment process. A one-state, one-vote holdover from the Articles of Confederation permits two-thirds of the states to call a constitutional convention. The Tenth Amendment stated that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The most commanding check of the federal government by the states was their legislative appointments of U.S. Senators. This founding check and balance power was obliterated by the 17th Amendment. It is the subject of this author's video, Uncommon Sense. It's the state stupid and will not be covered here. It is important to note that perpetuity, not state succession, was part of the framers' national vision that formed the United States of America. The Articles of Confederation expressly formed a perpetual union and it was ratified by all 13 states on March 1, 1781, with perpetuity clearly defined in its verbiage. Perpetuity is also implied, if not expressed, in our current U.S. Constitution, and for that matter, in the law of all national governments. It is safe to avow, according to Abraham Lincoln, that no government proper ever had a provision in its organic law for its own termination. Consequently, to the secessionists' dismay, the Union legally endures forever, it being impossible to destroy it except by some action not provided within the instrument itself. It follows from these legal points that no state upon its own mere motion or proclamation can lawfully shuck off the Union. Any resolves and or ordinances a state passes to effect secession are therefore legally void. Lincoln concluded that in view of the U.S. Constitution and its laws, the Union remained unbroken despite the southern state's succession. Therefore, President Obama is bound, as was Civil War President Abraham Lincoln, to protect and defend all express provisions of the U.S. Constitution, which includes putting down any state secession action. This does not mean, however, that a peaceful state secession may not be achieved. A change in the Constitution that would permit state secession through Article 5 in the form of a constitutional amendment or calling a constitutional convention is a path to peacefully dissolving the Union. The Congressional, then state amendment process, is well known by most Americans, but few realize it takes only two-thirds of the states to call a constitutional convention, thereby bypassing Congress and the President in amending or changing the U.S. Constitution. Once assembled, the convention delegates on a one-state, one-vote basis may pass anything they can agree on, with nothing to stop them from even dissolving the current Constitution, as the delegates did expressly against the federal government's authority in the 1787 
Philadelphia Constitutional Convention. The 21st century Constitutional Convention measures would then be presented directly to the state legislators. Only 38 states would be required to ratify all or part of the measures passed by the Constitutional Convention delegates. Therefore, the calling of a Constitutional Convention is a state legal step to bypass Congress, the President, and the Supreme Court to enact provisions for the states to peacefully secede from the Union. Such a convention may prove to be quite a revolutionary event, especially during a time of crisis such as it was in 1787 when the United States faced insolvency due to the federal debt, the collapse of the dollar, and outright armed citizen rebellion. There are many other measures more prudent correcting the current defects in the federal government than calling a constitutional convention. One is simply the repeal of Public Law 62-5 that limits the size of the House of Representatives. If the true representatives of the people were restored to the pre-1912 levels, the House would now hold about 2,400 representatives. People would personally know their representatives, and Congress would be answerable to a small block of constituents rather than lobbyists, media types, and anyone who was able to raise the candidates' money necessary to reach over 700,000 constituents every two years. A House of Representatives, as framed by the founders in 1787, would be a more manageable conduit for we the people to correct the defects in the federal government and change Washington. Under the current Constitution, secession is not an option, but the call for a constitutional convention or amendment permitting secession is not only plausible, it is perfectly legal. Should a constitutional convention be called in this time of growing financial insolvency, a mechanism for the states to secede could readily be adopted, marking the beginning of the end of the United States of America. Secessionists, Article Fibers, Tea and Green Party activists, my fellow Americans, look to the House and repeal Public Law 62-5 to find your voice and mechanism to correct the defects in the federal government. We, the people, must save the United States of America, so help us God. This is Stan Close. Thank you for webbing in. But that isn't the news in West Virginia. What is the news in West Virginia is this. West Virginia is a one-party state. Senator Byrd has the dream team of American politics. The governor's in his party, the three congressmen are in his party, the other senator is in his party, and the state house uh, is also in his party. And what is the bottom line of this one-party system that the Democrats here want so badly on Capitol Hill? What is the bottom line in West Virginia? What is the bottom line of $1.5 billion in special government projects that the appropriations have, the chairman have brought into West Virginia? The nation doesn't really know. The bottom line is this. West Virginia ranks number one in the nation in unemployment. West Virginia ranks number three in the nation in poverty. And West Virginia ranks number five on the death list. There are 45 states that have a higher standard of life expectancy than West Virginia. West Virginia is a national model to prove that government does not create jobs and a one-party system does not work. What creates jobs is the dream of a better life for yourself and your family. And what creates jobs is capital. And if you tax all the capital away, you're not going to have any new job. Is this race has just taken on national significance because the number one issue of our seven things here is the balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. And the single most powerful force against the balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, the reason why it has not been enacted by Congress, and you can ask any senator here, is Senator Robert C. Byrd. And only West Virginians can bring them home back to West Virginia and enact the balanced budget amendment to the Constitution in January. Thank you. Thank you, Stan.